And I'd like to thank you for being here with us in Kansas City and for being here at this session, Jewel of the Studio. And now I'd like to introduce our um, speaker today, David Sturm. And if, could I just get a show of hands of anybody who's ever talked to David Sturm on the phone or had him fix their kiln or something knows who this guy is? That's, that's good, that's a lot of you. So he was actually, as I was coming through the resource hall to introduce him today, I said something to somebody, I said, oh yeah, I'm going to introduce David Sturm's lecture. And they said, oh yeah, he's the rock star of repair. And he truly is, I promise I am not at all biased. He is such a rock star of repair that I liked him so much I went and married him. So he is also my husband. So, <laughs> but you will learn a lot and you will be entertained. And he also has a really epic beard. So if nothing else, you can just have fun watching that. So without further ado, I would like to present to you David Sturm. Thank you, so much for begging. Thank you very much, Cindy, and thank you to Ensika and all of you for, for coming. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to be part of the 50th anniversary and uh, shed some light on one of the most misunderstood pieces of equipment in the ceramic studio today. Uh, we all use them. Uh, we all do what we need to do in some way, shape, or form involving an electric kiln. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive into this. <clears throat> so what do you get when you cross a former advisor to Napoleon a brewer and a failed school teacher. Well, in addition to the setup for a very bad joke, we get three of the fundamental laws of physics that allow us to create a device that we use to fire ceramics. Uh, when applied together, the, the works of James uh, Jewell and Joseph Fourier and Georg Ohm, they give us the building blocks. Uh, they also let us predict uh, what's going to happen. Uh, and it lets us understand them. So we're going to dig into this because a lot of people don't really understand how these kilns work. Uh, and I promise we're only going to go as far as we need to uh, since this is not a physics conference. <laughs> so whenever I lecture, I like to begin with a question. Uh, and that question is always, what is an electric kiln? Well, it's the box over there in the corner that, that I don't know how to use. Or, or you know, it's, it's the, the thing we bisque in. Uh, but they really don't have a great understanding of it. But it, it, really, they, they sort of boil down to one of three answers. And the first one is this, uh, the magic shelf. Uh, we all ran into this in undergraduate, uh, where you, you would make your piece, and you'd put it on the shelf, and then you'd go home for the weekend, and you come back, and, oh, look, it's magic. It's bisque fire. Yay! And you take it, and you glaze it, you put it back on the shelf, and you go home, and, oh, it worked again. And it's wonderful. Um, and, and we all know that, that that's not how those work. Uh, the rude awakening happens to school teachers when they get hired and they walk into a room, they, where's my magic shelf? Uh, right. <laughs> so, so we know that this is really a non-answer, but this is how a lot of people understand it and they approach the electric kiln this way. That sort of thought is what leads us to push button ceramics. It's why we have a lot of makers nowadays that they just want to put their stuff in, in the box, push a couple of buttons, let the magic happen, and then take their stuff out of there. And we talk about how, well, I don't have time to learn it. Well, I don't know how it applies. You will learn how it applies if you understand just the very basics. So the second definition we get is this one. And this is more or less accurate. Uh, it's a very scary sort of thing to look at uh, because it, it makes a lot of assumptions. And this is why I don't like it. It assumes that you know what an insulating fire brick is. What on earth is canthal or elements? Is 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit appropriate? So yes, it's, it's, it's accurate. But I don't like this one either because it sort of gets too drilled down into what these things are and we're not there yet. This is the one I really like. I like this one a lot because it makes them approachable. Now is a kiln a toaster oven? No. No it is not. It is much more sophisticated than that. It does things that we need them to do, but it works on the same set of principles. And so anybody made toast, yeah, toaster ovens, and you've worked and you've used these, and you get up in the morning, you're bleary-eyed, and you turn them on. And so it's like when we're firing a kiln, and you're bleary-eyed, and you turn it on. Uh, so we're used to working with this. And so this lets us approach these as sort of a simple device that we can understand. So now that we're past that, let's get back to the three amigos here. And so their findings are telling us how and why this very big box gets as hot as it does. 
In our search for understanding, we can break this down into a couple of questions. Uh, how does it produce heat? And how does it contain heat? Or how much heat does it contain? Both these two things become important to us because we're doing what? Applying heat to do ceramic change. So we need to understand how those two things work. So let's drill into these guys individually. And again, we're going to scratch the surface. The first guy is Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier. So this guy in 1822 writes or publishes a, a paper and it becomes the foundation for the first law of thermodynamics. Um, we call it Fourier's law. He was actually building on the backs of giants. In this case, specifically Isaac Newton, who you may remember from your junior high school physics class. Uh, the guy with the apple that fell on his head, <laughs> that sort of thing. Force, that, he's one of the big names. Well, he comes up with this idea called the law of cooling. Okay, and Newton's law of cooling says that if I've got a body, two bodies, that this heat is going to leave this body dependent on how, what is the difference between the heat of this one and this one, right? So we're going to cool off in this manner, and it always moves from hot to cold, trying to achieve a balance. There's a problem with this theory, and that it doesn't apply across the board, and people struggled with this because when you're dealing with a fluid or you're dealing with a gas, that's not entirely true. And if you're dealing with radiation, it's not true at all. It doesn't work at all. But what Fourier does is he gets in there and he proves that it is actually true for a solid. So what we can do now is he comes up with this lovely little equation here, which has no numbers in it. Um, but we're going to talk about for a second what that is. The Q is actually what we're looking for, and that is the actual rate, uh, the amount of energy that moves from point A to point B. Let's talk about a kiln brick. From the inside of the kiln brick to the outside of the kiln brick, hot, cold, right? So the Q tells us how much energy is, is being lost through this kiln brick. And it's dependent upon the inverse, or negative, of K, which is the, en the, the rate at which energy will move through that product in a given space, so if it moves this many joules per inch, and I've got a three inch brick, we multiply that out and that's what we get there, and this funny little upside down triangle T, which stands for vector temperature. That is a, a measurement between what is the actual difference between the hot face and the cold face. What this helps us to understand is why a kiln that's cooling off drops the first hundred degrees like a stone, but that last hundred degrees, man, that's forever. You're just waiting. This is why, because as that vector gets closer together, it slows down. He proved that this is true. Next guy we're going to talk about is Georg Ohm, 1827, just a couple years later. He publishes his complete theory of electricity. In 1827, Georg Ohm, complete theory of electricity. He's not really correct in all of his assumptions, and his theories on acoustic law were dead wrong, but... He talked about electricity, and what he talked about electricity was dead right. Did he write Ohm's law? No, he did not. But what he proposed was the foundation for it, and that's why it was named in his honor. What we end up here is that lovely equation at the bottom, I equals V over R. In my opinion, this is the number one equation that, as a potter, you should know because this equation lets us tell a few things about what's going on in our kiln. Well, what do those mean? V, well, okay, V is voltage. Voltage is electricity that's coming out of your wall, and it can be measured, but you cannot change it. It is what it is, stick the meter, this is what this is. You can write that down. So if you have a 240 volt kiln, you can write down 240 volts. Resistance, that's the R, is a measurement of the physical property of the element itself. It's like when you're working with, with a high school gym, or a high school hallway, let's do it that way, and you've got passing period, and you need to go to the bathroom, right? The bathroom's at the end of the hallway. If you go during class time, there's nobody in the hallway, right? I have very little resistance getting where I need to go, okay? We do the same thing during passing period, and I've got all these people around in there. I'm running into all of them, right? And they're getting a little hot under the collar. So that's how more resistance in there, we're creating more heat. Got it? Okay, so we've got voltage and we've got resistance. That is a physical property of the element, and you can measure that too. We'll get into what you measure that with in a second. 
And then you have the I, and I is actually amperage. The I is for the French word for impedance, but it means amperage. And amperage is current. Current is a measurement of how much electricity went past point A in a given amount of time. And we'll remember that in a second because we're going to talk about Joule and why that overtime matters. But what this does is, is tell us what's going on. We can talk about elements. We can talk about what our elements do and how they age based on that number. The next guy we're going to talk about, James Joule. James Joule writes his first law, 1841, and he's working with circuits, resistive heating circuits, much like, much like Georg Ohm, and he notices that they produce heat, i.e., when we run that electricity across there, stuff gets hot. And it also produces a magnetic field and it also produces light. That's how an incandescent light bulb works. But Joule's watching heat. And so he takes a look at this and he says, I'm going to measure whether heat can do work. And so he does this by taking an electric battery and he hooks it up to a motor and he raises a one pound weight one foot off the ground. This is where we get a foot pound from. If you've, if you've ever studied pressure, that's where that comes from, a foot pound the amount of energy to raise one foot. He then takes a lump of charcoal and runs a steam engine to do the same thing. And he finds out that the charcoal was more efficient. So we learn that things are different, but heat can do work. And that is important to us because we use heat to do work. We use heat to make the ceramic change happen in the kiln. So he comes up with his predictability. P equals I squared over R. So I, we learned from the last one, is amperage. R is a resistor. So what is P? P is a measure of energy. We measure this in kilowatts per hour. Oh, look, there's another measurement over time. So is there a relationship between these? Yes, there is. And we'll talk about that again here in a moment. So let's put this together in a little more practical way. We're visual people. I like being visual. So now I've loaded up my kiln full of pots. No judgment on the pots. We're going to take electricity, we're going to throw it across a controller of some variety. That controller is then going to heat up our elements. Because the electricity hits the elements, that's a resistor, they generate heat. That heat then moves from the outside in. All right, this is Fourier at work here, because we have heat transfer through solids. So our heat has to move from the outside to the inside, and it's heating up the air. It's also got a, a direct radiation factor there, but it's also heating up the bricks that it's in contact with. And so we have our heat that comes in, and it works in the other way too. So when we're cooling down, it's an inside-out process. So our heat source is now the inside of the kiln, and it has to come outwards. So as it's moving outwards, it moves from the pots to the brick and to the side of the kiln, and then the air in the room collides with the side of that kiln and all those particles start robbing heat. And that's how we're radiating this into the room, okay? Sometimes we gotta speed this process up a little bit because we want to cool it off faster. And a lot of people have cracked the kiln open to speed that up. I have. <clears throat> this is actually bad for your kiln um, because you are thermal shocking the brick. Whenever you crack that thing open, you hear the little crack, 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 right? That's your lid that you're doing nasty things and you're gonna wear it out faster. Increasing the airflow around the kiln, you're increasing the amount of air that's colliding with the kiln and so you increase the rate that it cools off. And you don't have to open your lid to do it. So this is a really safe way to sort of cool your kilns down and we can apply for you the principles of what we know about him just by turning a box fan on it. Now, I'm not saying that your studio is you know, clean enough to do that, we don't wanna blow dust around, but you get the, the idea. Okay, electricity. <clears throat> this is where people scare themselves because Dave Barry gets this right. We get billed for it, <laughs> but nobody really knows what this is. So let's take a look at what we really need to understand and know about electricity. Okay, step one, safety first. This is a picture of me from a play last September, but I use this as a, whoa, whoa, hang on. We can't have a conversation about electricity unless we talk about safety first. Um, you should know how to handle this. And so we'll go on with, uh, our first thing is live, not live. Disconnect the kiln from power. You're not an electrician. 
you're not messing with live power, 30 amps can kill you. We draw a lot more amps, 30 volts can kill you in the right circumstances. But disconnect from power before you're working on it, don't be a path to ground. Don't assume that it's disconnected or turn off, check. I've actually pulled the control button panel off before, thought it was disconnected, it wasn't, pop, it goes off everywhere, scares the snot out of you. Um, I don't recommend that. Um, but don't assume that it's happening, check and make sure. If your kiln tripped a breaker, and it wasn't due to an electrical storm outside or a brownout or something along those lines, you have to assume that there's something wrong. If I go back there and I turn the breaker back on, that condition still exists. So don't just trip the breaker back on. If the kiln trips the breaker, find out what's going on before you apply power to it again. Okay, electricians versus kiln technicians. I know many electricians. They're highly trained individuals. They are very, very good at what they do. Their expertise stops at the outlet. Everything from the outlet back through your walls is their venue. I'm a kiln technician, that's not my venue. That's where they live. They are licensed to do this. Do I understand what's going on that wall? Yes. Can I give you advice on that? I can give you questions to ask, but you need to follow your electrician's advice over what needs to go in there. Then you hit the power cord of the kiln, and you have to remember that your kiln is an appliance. I don't hire an electrician to fix my refrigerator because it's not their wheelhouse. I hire a refrigerator guy to fix it. The same thing works with, with electric kilns. You need to get somebody who understands the electric kiln in order to fix it. Now, does that mean that you need to hire an, a kiln technician? No. You can fix a lot of the problems yourself, and I highly encourage that, and I teach people how to do it. And I do that because you need to know how to do this. Am I worried about job security? No. I've changed enough elements to know you're going to hire me to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that when you're stuck and you've got a thermocouple you need to flop out, trust me, that one's easy. Don't pay me to do it. Do that thermocouple yourself. If you really, really don't want to do it, okay, no problem. I'm more than happy to do that for you. But there are things you can do. But you need to know how your kiln works, and that's what we're doing today getting into that. Lastly is look before you leap. Um, you want to make sure that when you open panels up and you're putting things back together, you look and make sure you put all the wires back together. You don't have any extra screws left over before you turn the power back on. Uh, so just look before you leap before you plug things back in. Another, uh, okay. Electricity is not a physical thing in the same sense that a coffee mug or a bottle of water is a physical thing. I'm not going to reach out and pick it up. It is a physical thing, though, in that it's a set of phenomena that are physical that are associated with the flow of an electric charge, okay? Electrons, atomic level, jumping around, moving around all over the place, traveling from point A to point B and back, and that's what electricity is and how it moves. How does it do work? There's a whole lot of them, and they're moving pretty fast. That's how we get this, these little things to move around and to do work. Electricity moves along conductors. What is a conductor? A conductor is a material, any material, that allows the flow of electrons. Gold, silver, copper, water, human sweat. <laughs> um, I've zapped myself on that pretty well. Um, insulators, on the other hand, are the, are the opposite. They're things that don't allow electron flow. Rubber, air, wood, glass. You know the ceramics is not up there. I don't put it up there because we can make semiconductors out of certain ceramics in certain cases. So I don't put ceramic up there. For what we do, we use ceramics as an insulator, or as an insulator sometimes. It's a little uh, ceramic piece that the elements come through so that they don't touch the case of the kiln. We use it as an insulator because that particular ceramic isn't going to be a semiconductor. But regardless, we have conductors and insulators. A special kind of conductor is a resistor. So let's talk a minute about resistance. We talked about the description about the hallway and people you know, banging into each other down that hallway and you get hot under the collar, right? We can change resistance by changing a lot of things. If I change the length of that hallway, I have the same, more people fit in it, I have a longer resistance, right? There's more resistance. The same thing is true if I make the hallway narrower, but I keep the same number of people in it. I have more resistance to get through there because tinier spaces, I'm gonna hit more people. So that's a good thing to know about resistance, and we'll show how that applies to elements. 
in a moment too. Okay, measuring. How do you measure things? We talked about resistance. I said I would get some measuring. Here we are. You have to use the right tool for the right job. You use a ruler to measure distance. We use a scale to measure our chemicals for our glazes. We use a bathroom scale to measure how many Girl Scout cookies I ate yesterday. And we have to remember that these are what we would use to design this. How do you measure electricity? Simple tool. This is called a multimeter. A multimeter is the tool you need. You do need a digital one. This is the 21st century. We need to be accurate. They're not that expensive. But you need to buy a good one. So get some advice from your local kiln tech over what's a good one to buy. You don't want to overbuy it. The one that I own is very expensive, but it was given to me. It does a lot more than I ever use it for. <laughs> but both models are, are accurate. I like the one on the left because you can actually measure amperage with that little clamp thing. Um, the one on the right is more of electronics. Uh, but that's more like the one that I have. Uh, either one will do the job for you as long as it's going to measure the right range. So that's a good thing to talk to your local electrician or your local kiln technician about what could or how to use it. Read the manuals. <laughs> Read the manuals on this. All right, so the math behind it all, let's take what we've got here and let's apply it. If we take a look at Ohm's law and Joule's law here, they look pretty similar. They're sharing some common variables in there. So Naturally, the next question is, is there a relationship between them? The answer is yes. And there it is. This is the wheel. If you have the journal, this is printed in my article. So you don't have to try to write this down. But this is how you do all the transformations based on if you know something, you can calculate the rest. So if I know amperage, or if I want to find amperage, there are three equations up there to figure it out depending on, well, what do I know? Pretty easy to work with. Again, that's in the journal article. Um, now, this dark diagram uses E instead of V for volts. E basically stands for energy in this case. Uh, I use volts. Uh, v is a, a, an easier way to remember it for me, um, and a lot of people do that. All right, let's get past this. Let's go into the key components of a kiln. We're going to take this, what we've learned about electricity, we're going to apply it through. Yeah, <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide. I love that one. So here we are with the kiln, and we have the key components of a kiln. We have of course, the electricity, we have an element, that's our resistor, we have a control panel, we have an insulator, and we have sensors. Pretty basic stuff. This is how we work with this electric kiln. I like to look at it in a systems approach to start with because we can start with the broad strokes and then dial into the specifics. Inputs and outputs. Whenever you're looking at these systems, you have to think what's coming in and what's coming out of a system. When we look at uh, Ohm's law, for example, voltage is known, resistance is known. So your voltage is an input. We run it across a resistor and we get an output. It's a lot easier to think of it that way. And then we need to know what each part does and that's kind of what we're here to do, is how do we, how do we apply this and what does each part do and how does that inform what we're doing? Let's start with the insulator. Bricks or ceramic fiber, different K values. And You've seen bricks that have you know, K18 or K23 or, or, or K26 bricks, and then we've seen gas kilns. An easier way to sort of remember this is that if the lower the K number that's on there, it's actually a better insulator, but it's going to melt faster. Now, are we going to take these bricks to the point where they melt? I certainly hope not. They melt really, really hot. But for electric kilns in the US, primarily they're using K23 or K25 brick. That's what they're using because they found that they give you the best bang for your buck when you try to weigh sort of the options over, am I efficient in heating this? Am I going to last a very long time? So they're using K23 brick, which is pretty soft, but it's good stuff. I really like it. It does a good job. It does not like reduction atmospheres because it's really, really shot full of holes. Can you fire it in reduction? We'll get to that in a minute. The answer is yes, but there are caveats. And that's what we're going to get to caveats when we talk about elements. But it does not like reduction atmospheres, it's going to break it down. Unless you clear the carbon out of the brick. So if you do a reduction in, in let's say I take a raccoon kiln that I've taken an old kiln out of, and I burn it and I get the carbon, it's all stuck in the bricks, I need to burn that carbon out of the bricks just by doing an oxidation fire and to get rid of it so they don't break down as quickly. And lastly, everything else in a kiln, it all changes shape. You know, when something gets hot, it gets bigger. In this case, if we have a kiln, you're going to notice that you've got the little orange lines around the sections. That's light coming through. And that's because they've changed shape during the firing and gotten bigger in certain places and not. It's not necessarily gapped, but you're going to be able to see that light because it's radiating through. Next thing we're going to talk about are sensors. 
And these are sort of the three sensors that we use nowadays. We have, of course, the kiln sitter tube. Many of you haven't seen the, the business end of it uh, down here, which is the connection point. That's a kiln sitter tube, and that's used on manual kilns. Uh, it's, it's taking that cone, bends to 90 degrees, shuts the kiln off. On the upper side there, that's a type K thermocouple. Um, thermocouples run on something called the Seebeck effect. Uh, we have two dissimilar metals. One's magnetic, one's not. They're welded together at the end, and when they get hot, it creates its own little microvolt. As it gets hotter, the speed that that goes through, or the current, changes. And the computer can say, hey, that's faster, move the needle. That must be going up. And that's a known effect and it's a known rate. So that's how thermocouples work. And then, of course, we have cones. And cones, as a sensor, are extremely important, even when you're doing computer kilns. Because the cone is right. The cone will tell you what happened, provided you took care of the cones. The cone will tell you what actually happened in that kiln. And so you want to look at this kiln, you want to look at your firing, what happened, what happened, what happened. And it'll help you diagnose, do I have a thermocouple that's starting to go out? I can look at the cone. So it's a good sensor as well. All right, elements. Elements are made nowadays, most of them are made of canthal. Canthal is a metal alloy. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, it's an iron and iron and chrome and nickel and, and a number of things, but it's an alloy. And when you fire it, it creates this wonderful little oxide layer on the outside. And that oxide layer protects it, protects it from, from being all beat up and, and getting nasty and everything. But as you fire this, this kiln, that material has to come from somewhere. And the oxide layer gets thicker, and the actual core material gets thinner. And there's our hallway as we were going down the road, or, or in, the, in the high school, because we're increasing resistance, because our conductive material is getting smaller. Does our oxide layer stay that thick? No, it doesn't. It blows off of there. And as it does that, it has to rebuild itself. So we can affect element life by what's going on inside the kiln. So if I'm firing a lot of material that we're burning out, like teachers using uh, newspaper to, as a prop, paper clay in some, in some instances, lusters in some instances, they, they will really just eat up that oxide layer and they strip it right off. And so they decay faster because of that. Generally speaking, when an element's resistance has increased 10%, it's time to change it. Is it still going to get hot? Yep. Is it still going to get hot enough? Nope. We can get by while we're waiting on the elements to come in by taking some of the mass out of the kiln, just loosen it up a little bit, and we can still get through. But that's why we'll all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute. I can't get to cone 6, but I can still bisque fire because my elements are starting to age out. A note on designing your own elements or building your own electric kilns. Can it be done? Yes. Do I recommend it? No. I don't. This diagram here in the lower left describes how element winds should be, and if you don't have any idea what that is, you have no business trying to make kill. There's a lot more science and a lot more math that goes into element design to get it right. So I don't recommend making your own kilns unless you take a class, learn about it, dig deeper into this. So a few things about elements. As elements get old, they deform and get brittle. This lovely kiln right here, this is not a picture that I took, but this is lovely kiln right here, is a set of brittle elements that went in all as one piece and they were all great and I know they were coming out in pieces about an inch long. Snap, 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 snap. And what that means is that it took a lot longer to change those elements than it should have. They were wasting a lot of electricity running on old elements because they weren't getting as hot. These elements I know took three times as long and they can take a lot less if you just change them on time. Measure your resistance. Count how many firings you've got. That will help us know about how long you should go. Element life does depend on many factors, though it's not just number of firings. It's not just what's in the kiln. It's all of these things. Do you have a hold at the end of it? And so your elements are going to last a different amount of time than your elements do. And so we have to know all these things, but we measure the resistance as a tech because I can measure it and say, yep, we're good. Nope, we need to change them. And we can do that. So we take our elements and we arrange them into something called circuits, all right? On the right, we have a series circuit, and on the left, we have a parallel circuit. These are the basic circuits that we work with. Right is series, left is parallel. Oh, I'm sorry. Left is series, right is parallel. That's my fault. <laughs> so let's take a look at the series circuit first. We'll blow this up. Anybody old enough to remember the 1970s Christmas tree lights? One light goes out, they all go out. That's a series circuit in a nutshell. We put these two elements in line with each other. Electricity has to go across both of them. Now we work with alternating current. 
which means it, it's doing this, we're not working with direct current, but it has to go across both of those resistors in order to make our circuit, in order for electricity to flow. One breaks, they both break, or they both go out even though you know, the one is still good. We can use a, a multimeter to find out which element is broken. So this is, that's the series circuit in a nutshell. Back here. So now we're going to talk about parallel circuits. Parallel circuits are a little different. Parallel circuits are arranged in branches. And what that means is that electricity is going to go to all of them at the same time. So if one breaks, the other one still fires. And that's good for us because it's easier to tell when an element's broken. But it also, on the older manual kilns, let us do some different things as far as directional. We could apply power to both or one and make sort of controller kilns that way. So that's the basics of a, of a parallel circuit. 10 ohms. By the way, the, the omega symbol up there is, is how we write ohms because we measure resistance in ohms for Ohm's law, much like you measure distance in feet and inches. We take these circuits and we stack them on top of each other and we're starting to look a little more like something that we know. On the right there, that's very similar to a SCUT 818. On, or the, sorry, on the left. On the right, we're looking at something that's more like a, a 1027 or a BX2327. Uh, uh, and these, these are kilns. And they're arranged into these circuits. And what they've done here is that our, each of our rings is an individual circuit. And that helps us control them individually so we can fire them individually. Now on to controls. We have to control a kiln. The only thing we can do is tell electricity when to go, how fast to go, or where to go. That's all we can do with it. In this way, a computer kiln and a manual kiln are identical because they're doing the same thing. They're doing it a little differently, but they're doing the same thing. Just control power flow. Three steps to this, sense, decide, and act. You take a look at what's going on, decide if something needs to be changed. Do I need to turn up a switch yet? I'm sensing by the seeing my temperature climb, and I act. Turn it up or don't turn it up. A computer does the exact same thing, those same three steps. Sense what's going on, compare it to our program. Do I need to do something? If so, do it. All right. A moment on open and closed circuits before we get into wiring diagrams, and I promise you, you'll understand them, all right? When a circuit is open, electricity can't flow. I like the drawbridge analogy. If our car is like our electricity and it's going along our, our resistor, that drawbridge is up, I go nowhere. So in an open circuit, nothing happens. If we have a closed circuit, off we go. We, electricity can flow and we get our circuit and things will heat up. This is a very, very basic kiln circuit. On the left, I got it right that time. On the left, we have a power cord. That's what that little symbol is. In the middle there, that's a switch. And then we have our parallel circuit over here on the right. And you see how we're broken. So when our switch is going to turn on and off, it's going to connect the circuits and close the circuit. Electricity goes. And then when it turns off, it breaks the circuit and opens things up. A kiln sitter does this. An uh, infinite control switch does this. Timer switches do this. Toggle switches like your light switch, they do this. It's all on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And when you're doing a manual kiln, you have to decide when you turn it on and off to a degree, unless you have that lovely little infinite control switch which cycles on its own. When it's on low, it spends a lot more time off than it does on. And when it's on high, it's on all the time. But it's still changing how fast it's opening and closing. <clears throat> the other thing we can do is we can change the direction that energy is going in like this. Or if we change that by turning our switch, this is indicative of like a low, medium, high switch, it's actually changing the direction that energy is flowing. And in this particular condition, it's just in one case it'll be firing both elements in series, in the next it'll be, it'll be firing only the bottom element, so on medium only your bottom element is glowing and that's normal because it changed the direction of power flow. And then on high, all your elements are glowing again and we're glow they're firing in parallel at that point in time. It's a little more complicated than that, but we get the general idea. Now I'm starting to put some funny little symbols up here as well because they're drawn differently on a wiring diagram. 
when you open this thing up and you're like, oh my gosh, what's this? It's a map. If you can read a road map, even a very simple one, you can read a wiring diagram. You just need to know what they are. I've put a little picture underneath of what those two symbols are for, for how we sort of represent them. And they come a little different way. But that first thing in line is a kiln sitter. And that's how I've seen them drawn. Because it's a, it's a, inter, it's a plunger. And it'll, you push the button in, it connects. And then it pops loose. What you see there is the back side of that kiln sitter. So if you open your kiln up, oh, that's the kiln sitter. I know what that is. And on the right there, this could be an infinite control switch, a timer, a toggle switch. That is a picture of, an infinite, of the back of an infinite control switch. A toggle switch looks like a light switch. Um, timer switches have a little dial on them, but you'll know because you'll actually look at your wiring diagram and figure it out. Here's where we talk about mechanical relays for a minute because this becomes the next step. Mechanical relays were put in line on manual kilns when you had to draw more power through the circuit that the switch could handle. So you have the switch drive a relay and the, rel the switch will tell the relay when to open and close, but it's doing the same thing opening and closing. That's the clicking you're hearing when your kiln's firing. Opening and closing. Now, not all manual kilns use these. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But then we kept this idea when we moved to computerized kilns. And we changed it so instead of pulling full line voltage across it, we start using a smaller amount of voltage because our boards put out a smaller amount of voltage. And we can do this. These work because there's an electromagnet in there. And so power comes in on the normally uh, closed terminal or normally open. And when it clicks on, it makes connection. Oh look, we made that connection, power goes through. And then when the computer or the switch decide that it needs to turn off, it cycles off. On, off, on, off. Pretty much the same thing that we were doing earlier. Just a little more elegant way of doing it. Uh oh. Now we've made that step into something that, that people get confused by and this is a very, very basic computerized kiln but it looks pretty much the same. We've got what replaces what. We have the relay and the computer have replaced the switch. The thermocouple and computer in conjunction have replaced the kiln sitter. We've got a little thing in there called a transformer and what that transformer does is it takes the main voltage coming out of the wall and it backs it way down because I don't want to put 240 volts across my, my computer. In this case, it will cause problems. They run on 12 volts. <laughs> so it steps it down. Well, since the computer only takes 12 volts in, it puts 12 volts out, or 24, depending on the board. And that's what's driving the relay, the magnet on the relay. The other thing over there, we've got a fuse in line. Everybody knows what a fuse is, or you've used a fuse of some variety. It's a device that, that is designed to basically break or break connection if it gets too hot. And that's jewel working, so we, they can design these things to say, okay, when I've, when I've gotten this hot, open up. And that, we say that's that many amps. And then the other thing is a power connection block. So we can use those to, to sort of, power comes in and then it spreads out across your wires. Now all of those lines up there are a wire. I can actually take this, put it in front of me, open my panel, trace my wires with my fingers and run into these components. That's this, got it, okay. That's where we're at here. So what we can do with this is take a look at where did our problem occur? So if I've got a kiln that will not heat up at all, I turn the thing on and the board doesn't power up. Where's my problem? Where do I start looking? Well, if the board won't power up at all, it could be the board, it could be the transformer, it could be the power block, or further back. I don't have to even look at the relays. I don't have to look at the elements. I can ignore all of that because it's not even part of that system. The same way if I've got a computer that opens up, hi, I'm here, ready to go, and it's telling the relays to turn on and off, but they're not, well, how do, I, how do I see that? Well, I may have one section that's out, but the other two are firing fine. What can cause that? Well, the relay that's driving that section could be our problem. It could be the computer, or it could be the elements in that section, but it's not going to be the transformer. It's not going to be the fuse. It's not going to be the parts of the system that aren't in line with that. And so we can use our diagrams once we understand them to start diagnosing things, follow the maps, and see where they go. So now it's time to talk about sort of the future and the future is now and what's going on with these. So we have some different things up here. Um, the first thing down here on the lower right as you're looking at it, that's a solid state relay. Solid state relays do not have moving parts. 
They're chemically moderated, which means they're gonna last longer because nothing moves. The downside is they produce a lot of heat. They get very, very hot. And if I put that in the same box that I've got a computer controller in, the computer controller gets too hot. Um, so we have to be careful that we dissipate that heat uh, in order to use them. Uh, some kilns are, are putting little fins out on the front of that. It's a heat, a heat sink. It's literally putting more surface area right on the back side of this thing to allow heat to escape the kiln. Um, I've seen people try to put a fan on the box uh, and blow air up through there, increase that air velocity to cool things down inside the control box. Uh, another company has actually put their control panel, separated it so my computer's over here and the rest of the business is over here so that they can keep them separate from each other. But either way you look at it, solid state relays are a great idea for getting in there. Uh, Wi-Fi is happening. Uh, Wi-Fi is, is a beautiful thing because now my computers can talk through the internet. They can talk to me. They can talk to my, my computer. They can talk to my cell phone. They can talk to uh, a remote cloud service of some variety. And those things, like Scott's Kiln Link, or, or you know, those things can happen, but you have to remember that this is not a remote firing process. Remote firing is not okay. It's actually not allowed in the US. Remote monitoring, on the other hand, is, and that's what these really are. They're designed so that I can turn my kiln on and go upstairs. And I need to check on it. I don't have to go downstairs to check on it. I can pull my computer up and look at it, okay? My kiln shut off. Great. And it tells me, hey, there's a problem. And it tells me on my, on my cell phone, hey, there's a problem. Wonderful. I need to figure it out. Okay. Not wonderful. But, but remote firing is not, is not the way to go. It will allow us to data log. We can take a snapshot of our firings and we can record those. And eventually over time, you can see what's happening in your firings. You can see, okay, well, this result came out of here on this sort of a firing. Do I need to adjust my firings? You can adjust your firing and say, oh, look, okay, I see what the change is. Uh, I heard recently that, that you, can, you can never use any of the data you don't collect. But you can use some of the data that you do collect. And eventually, you'll use most of the data that you collect. You just may not know how, to, know how today. So data collection is great. And then up there, um, that's a touch screen controller. These are coming. Um, I know that this is launched. Uh, Bartlett is, is putting these out. There's another one out there called uh, TAP, uh, I think is what it's called. But these are making our interfaces easier because the thing that scares people the most that I have found about computer controllers is they don't know how to talk to it. They have no idea what those four little symbols mean. Five, three, G, five. What does that mean? Well, it's actually seg or segments. Um, but unless you know that, you don't know it. These are much more intuitive because it's plain English. I can move things around. We live in a, in a digital world where we use our cell phones and we're used to swiping and pinching and this sort of thing. And so we're starting to make our interfaces react more to that. So it's wonderful. And then up there on the top, that's a current sensor. These exist. They've existed for a little while now. Uh, they're standard on some kilns, not standard on others. But what those let us do is take some of those measurements. Like we can measure what is the amperage draw of the kiln. I can measure to a degree, or calculate what the resistance of that circuit is. So if I'm coupling these things together, my kiln could have a problem and say, hey, I have a problem. And you sit down at your computer and say, well, what's the problem? I ping the, the board, the board says, okay, I'll run my diagnostics. It does, and throws them back and says, okay, the resistance in circuit two is low. Okay, I need to go look at circuit two then. And it's, it's gonna be able to tell us these things. Now it's coming in certain ways, it makes it in certain fashions, it's coming into baby steps because it's all new technology. But this is what's happening. Is it making me obsolete? No. Not at all. But it's helping you understand what's going on in your equipment so that you can better take care of it. You can better manipulate how you're firing to achieve the results you're looking for. I'll close out a final uh, example of that. We had a customer who called me recently and she's having a problem with her, with her slow cooling. She wanted her kiln to crash cool to 1800 Fahrenheit and then really slow down to about 150 degrees an hour until she dropped down to 500 degrees and then let it go. Her problem was she was getting these error messages all over the place because, oh wait, my temperature's way too low. Oh wait, my temperature's way too low. That's what the error message meant. And she's like, I don't understand because I'm plummeting and it's supposed to, to do this. And I said, well, think of it this way. You're dropping too quickly. It's like riding a skateboard down a hill. 
there's a 90 degree turn at the bottom. Do you want to just go for it? Or can you slow that down so that you approach this and then turn? We succeeded by just having her rate of climb change from 9999 to just 999. The kiln still drops at its normal rate. It's still going to drop 1,000 degrees an hour? No. But it's still going to drop at its normal rate. It just says, hey, whoa, slow down, put the brakes on. Put the brakes on as you get closer. So that's an example of, of taking the data that we're learning and applying it to change how our kilns work. Last thoughts, again, safely, work safely. Electricity is, is a thing that can hurt you, but it's also our friend. We can use it, we're going to use it. When troubleshooting, again, start the symptoms, work backwards. We have to know what is it doing. The most common problem that I find in electric kilns, and it's, it's an absolute epidemic, people call me with this problem all the time, and I wish those kiln companies would just do something about it. They call me up, they say, Dave, I have a problem. I say, what that? They say, my kiln's broken. <laughs> okay. How? <laughs> so we start asking questions, and a good technician's going to do that. They're going to start asking questions. They're the same kind of questions you can ask. How is it broken? Well, what's it doing? What's it not doing? What sound is it making? Can you let me listen to that? All of this information informs our, our process. It tells us what we're doing. Understanding how it works makes that job a lot easier. It's a system. I can figure out. Don't even look at this. Here we go. Well, I think it's my elements. Why? Why do you think it's your elements? It's not even in the, in the element system. You can look at that and see that. The last thing on here, oh, yeah, know your model serial number, voltage, and phase. When you call for our support, write that down. It's on your kiln on a little data plate because it has to be by law. LT3K is not a kiln model. <laughs> that is a kiln sitter model. Do not tell me you have an LT3K kiln because you don't. <laughs> and then kilns are not magic. They do exactly one thing. They get hot. We spend an awful lot of time on the potter's wheel learning how to manipulate and work a piece of equipment that does one thing. It spins in a circle. That's all it can do. And we approach those, and we learn them, and we're great at it. We can learn kilns, too, because they're not magic. It's basic principles. Thank you very much. Anybody who has any questions, we've got a little bit of time. Hello. Hello. This is, I've always worked on my own kilns successfully, but there's a question I've never figured out. Sure. Resistance creates more heat. So why, when an element wears out and the resistance goes up, does the element get colder? Okay. So resistance creates heat, but as our resistance go up, you put it back in the formula, volts, amps, and resistance, or put it back in the power, it, we, we find out what our current is, okay? If you look at the math on that formula, as your resistance increases, because it's just algebra, mm -hmm. resistance increases, your amperage decreases, okay? Amperage is what we plug into our, our power formula to tell us how much power is coming out of there. Do the math that way, and you'll see it, okay? Basically, in, in a nutshell, there's less material there to make heat with. And so less material, yeah, the resistance is going to go up, but there's not enough there to work with. So it's due to the narrowing of the element from oxidation. The narrow, it, will, it will narrow, and as it narrows, the resistance increases, the amount of heat decreases. Yes. It becomes a choke point rather yes. than just resistance. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Dave. For averaging in your experience for lifespan of elements per number of firings, not using me in as an example, but what in your experience for replacement for like, I mean, there's people here from schools who are constantly firing their kilns. Mm -hmm. What do you say for like a 1027 or the 1227s for like Scott or whoever is a good number to go by, as you say, to replace when you lost your 10, 15%? Okay, so I, I like to look at this as more of a better place to start looking uh, and to get out your meter and start measuring things. Because again, element life is dependent on a lot of factors. 
Generally speaking, let's say we're going to cram a kiln full of work all the time. I'm a K-12 teacher and I'm stuck, so I'm cramming this kiln full, so I've got a lot of thermal mass in there, which means that they have to heat up longer to absorb more heat because there's more work that's got to be done, right? So these elements are going to be powered longer and they're going to wear out faster. I'm firing a cone 10. It's going to get hotter. They're going to wear out faster. I'm firing a cone 6. They're going to wear out faster than if I do low fire. In general speaking, and I hate necessarily giving this answer because it's kind of a non-answer, but I like looking at right around, if I'm doing cone 6 generally, I look at right around 75 firings, I start looking. That does not mean you're dead at 75. That means I start looking because, let's face it, you're going to end up with, I need a show tomorrow. My kiln's down. I should have changed the elements. Keep a kiln log and you'll know how many firings you have. Some of the new computers will actually keep that number for you. Read your manuals, they'll tell you, or call your friendly local kiln technician, and we'll tell you how to find that information and if your kiln has it. But yeah, it's sort of, I would start at 75 on that. I've seen um, cone six firings go into the hundreds. Uh, low fire, I've seen some low fire kilns only do 100, 100 and a half, or 150 firings. I've seen one that had 250 firings on it. Um, and it just depended on what were they doing. Were they firing fast? The faster you fire, the hotter the element has to get to do the same heat work, wears out faster. So that's another good reason to slow down. But does that answer your question, Mike? Okay. Thanks. Um, a lot of the kilns, the electric kilns for sale in my area seem to be three-phase, mm -hmm. which I understand can't be put in a residential um, place. Correct. Is it worth it to buy a three-phase kiln if you can get a good deal and convert it down to single phase? I would honestly say no. Because I would say that the, the electric kiln you should be buying is single, is single phase. They can be built that way. They are built that way all the time. When I sell, are you talking about, well, are you talking about used kilns or are you talking yes. about new kilns? Yes, a used kiln. Okay, a used kiln. If the kiln is in very, very, very good condition, okay, then I would say you can save some money by going that route but you need to know what you're getting into. There's some kilns where you have to change the elements in addition to some of the wires to make that work. It is a lot easier to step down from three phase to single phase generally. So yes, but I would say call your local tech first. Find out what actually needs to be done and then you, get up, then you can get where the money actually is and am I actually saving money here? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You talked about canthal elements, but there are other materials, correct, for elements that Absolutely. are more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, does the longevity of those materials justify the price, or what's your experience with them? Are you talking about APM elements, or are you talking I'm about... I'm talking about any other materials that are just more expensive, longer lasting. There are pros and cons to all of it. I think the most common one we find are APM elements, which is still canthal. It's just made a different way. It's a powdered metal. Um, and what that allows it to do is actually spend more time hotter without decaying as quickly. If you're firing cone 10, yep, they're worth it. Are you just doing bisque firing? No, you're not going to see enough of a, of a shift in how many fires you're getting out of it for the matter. If you're looking at uh, molyb molybdenum disilicide elements or if you're looking at, at nicrothal, different sort of materials are going to decay differently. And so you need to, to know, well, what material am I looking at? Does it justify the cost? I hate to say sometimes, but it depends on what are you firing. How are you using the kiln? And let's find out. Molly disilicides last a ridiculous amount of time, but they shatter like glass if you bump them. And they're very expensive. <laughs> so pros and cons. You know, industry uses them all the time. They also reduce in electric kilns using hydrogen. So there's different ways to do a lot of different things. But I would say, again, how are you using that kiln? Ask that question and then find out, is this an appropriate element for what I'm doing? So you said for cone 10, yes. What about just cone 6 and this fire? For cone 6, you're going to see some savings for sure. Um, do I think that, I think it's sort of up in the air, if you ask me. Are you doing a lot of hard cool downs? If you're doing a lot of powered cool downs, that kind of thing? Yes, because it's not just, you know, heat works not just up, it's down, and elements decay when they're energized. So. The longer they have power, the faster they, they wear out. So yes, for six, I'd say sure. APMs are worth it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, David. Hello. I'm sorry. I lost my voice. Oh, me too. <laughs> uh, 
Um, what is the best way to test the resistance levels of your elements? Multimeter. You can actually take your multimeter, set it to resistance, unplug the kill. Okay. Open your circuit up, open your control panel up, take a look at your wire diagram, find out, okay, where it's basically, let's say it's a 1027 or one of the new computer kilns where the wires come off and they, they sort of tab into the little thing. Find out where your circuits are. So if one and two go to my top circuit, pop that there and measure it. And you're going to get a ring resistance or an entire circuit resistance. The, the information that's published for what your resistance should be measures from that point. Do I need to know what the individual element resistance is? Well, sure, we can measure that too. But we have to do a few things differently, and those numbers aren't always available to the public. So most of the, the, they try to make it as easy as they can to let you do it. So I would say right at the element connection points, whether that is on the terminal strip or on a manual kiln, it's where it hooks up to the switch. I would measure them there or right where the wires tie on if you've got a single, like a series circuit at both ends of the series. So I have a friend who puts one of the probes on the element and one of the probes across the plug. It plays on plug. So, so that you've got one on an element and one and on the one power on, cord? Holding on, holding on to the plug, uh -huh. that, that round part of the three-prong plug. Okay, yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Uh, you're not measuring resistance of the element at that point in time. But am I, oh, okay. It's measuring resistance of the, the back circuit there because you've, you've rounded it through. Okay. So to measure the element, you need to measure the element. Take um, a shortcut, that's what you get. Right, okay. no shortcuts. <laughs> Got it. No Got shortcuts. It. Thank you, David. <laughs> yep. Over here. Hi. I work in a rural part of Montana, and I am my own friendly kiln tech. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Well done. Um, so what I'd like to know, I have a kiln issue. I have an old AIM kiln that's about 40 years old. Mm -hmm. The elements were replaced about 20 years ago. It will only go to cone 09. All the elements are lit. Would it be a relay problem? What do you think? Your elements are toast. Elements are toast, so rewire, re-element re the whole thing. Take your resistance measurements and find out. Okay. AIM has those numbers. Okay. Take your resistance. If you're 10% higher than what it should be, my guess is you're a lot more than that. Okay. You're done. And okay. you just need to change your elements and they'll go back again. That's assuming you have the right power coming in, of course. Correct. If, you, if power is stable, check your resistance. Okay, thank you. Huh? Okay. Well, thank you very much. We've got a little more time between sessions here, so I'm going to come down over here. If anybody wants to meet me over here or back at the Brockers booth in, uh, in the resource hall, that's sort of where I'm going to be the rest of the day. Um, and, and feel free to come up and ask me anything. I promise I don't bite hard. Um, and a lot of you know me that I don't. So thank you again very much.